This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. history of the CIA, not one agency staff attorney has ever wielded more influence or power than John Rizzo. A self-described company man, Mr. Rizzo joined the CIA back in 1976 and over the next 34 years helped guide the agency through a host of controversies and scandals, from Iran-Contra to the extraordinary rendition of suspected terrorists. Mr. Rizzo retired from the CIA in 2009. But this year he returns to the spotlight with an absolutely fascinating memoir. It's called Company Man, 30 Years of Controversy and Crisis in the CIA. John Rizzo, welcome to Legally Speaking. Good to be here, Marty. I, I'd like to begin this conversation by uh, reading to you a blurb that appears on the back cover of your book. Actually, it's the very first blurb. It's uh, written by a, a Washington Post columnist named uh, David Ignatius. He writes, quote, think of Tom Hagen, the Corleone family lawyer in The Godfather, and you begin to get the flavor of what Rizzo has seen and heard. Now, I think what's interesting about that blurb is that it suggests that there's an, a an analogy to be made between what you did at the CIA and Mr. Hagen's role as the lawyer for the Corleones. Uh, now, I know that you can't be entirely comfortable with that analogy, but are there similarities to be acknowledged? Obviously, I would never equate the CIA with an with a organized crime um, organization. Sure. But once you get beyond that... Um, but beyond that, are there similarities that, to be acknowledged? Yeah, I mean, the consigliere, the Tom Hagen character in The yeah. Godfather, uh, you know, as you recall, he was very close to the family, was was considered a quasi part of the Corleone family, but he was not of the Corleone family. And he was relied upon, confided in, but as you recall, he always had a certain detachment about the advice he was giving about something the family was gonna do that was gonna get them, gonna get them in uh, trouble or a, a venture that, that was going to come back and haunt them or kill them. Uh, in that way, there is a, I must say, a certain parallel mm -hmm. between a Tom Hagen and the kind of role I played for all those years at the CIA. But, but a consigliere, his job is not necessarily to advise on how to stay on the right side of the law. His job, more often perhaps, is to advise how to break the law and get away with it. Is that part of what you did as a lawyer for the yeah. CIA? Well, there is a danger in taking this analogy too far, Marty. Uh, <laughs> well, you to have get... been called a legal enabler, am I, I right? I have been. That was in another, uh, I believe that was a Washington Post review of yeah. the book. Uh, and what is an e a legal enabler, after well, all? Well, I mean, that particular description, honestly, I don't think was intended as a compliment, but I, I take it as such, <clears throat> because that's what my uh, role was, really. Uh, I didn't see my role, for instance, as just every time I, I was told or something was run by me for proposed covert operation, I would just say, no, can't do it, it's stupid, it's not just illegal, even if it's legal, it's, it's crazy, don't do it, you'll get in trouble, I'll get in trouble. That, was, that would not be a, a useful role, a constructive role, a necessary role for a CIA lawyer. I always thought my entire years there was my role was first and foremost to do my damnedest to ensure the agency operated within U.S. law, but also to 
provide advice and guidance to allow the agency to carry out its vital mission, uh, uh, intelligence mission, to protect uh, the country and defend the country's interests. That's why I thought my, my real role was, was to enable CIA to do what it was created to do. Let me take you back to the summer of 1975. You were, what, 26, 27 years old at the time? <laughs> 27, yeah. And, and you were working for the U.S. Customs Service. You were a lawyer there. And uh, it doesn't. It didn't sound like a very exciting gig. And in fact, in your book, you say that you were bored to tears. So you decided to apply to the CIA, and you did so at a time when the agency was getting just an enormous amount of bad press. This was when the public first started to become aware of some of the unseemly things that uh, the agency had done over the course of the Cold War. We're talking about assassination plots. We're talking about overthrowing democratically elected governments. We're talking about money laundering, fixing elections, and most bizarrely, subjecting unwitting subjects to LSD experiments. <clears throat> unwitting Just, Americans, actually, yeah. I understand that you were bored with your the job that you had, but why would you want to join an organization that had done all these unseemly things for so long. Yes, it does seem counterintuitive, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Um, the fact that, that all that, all the terrible misdeeds I was learning about that CIA conducted was the spur for me to apply to, yeah. to come to the CIA. Well, I mean, it, it, were you that bored? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was 27 years old. I was sort of young and full of myself. I was, I was, uh, I was ambitious. Yeah, and I, I, I was bored. I don't know. Well, I thought I'd be doing it at age 27, but yeah, I was bored. I wanted to do something uh, uh, more more uh, challenging, mm -hmm. and I feel like I was, you know, playing a, a more of a contribution than I thought I was. I knew I was at, at the custom service, so that's why I did it. I mean, that's why I, I had itchy feet, so to speak. I thought uh, that in the wake of those those hearings, those revelations over the past over activities over the previous 30 years. You know, I had I had given no thought to CIA in my life really before then, mm -hmm. uh, and I thought even at my young age that I had no idea whether the CIA had lawyers. It sounded like if they had them, they hadn't been consulted very much over the previous three decades. But they were certainly going to need more of them now, and that they would possibly want to be reaching out to bring in lawyers who had no prior connection to CIA, young lawyers, and so I. You know, I didn't know anyone there. I just, I just, it was, a, it was a leap of faith, as I put it in my book, to apply because I thought, in my own way, I could, you know, be part of the new wave, so to speak, the, uh, the, the, the new modern CIA that grew out of those church committee hearings. So, did you see yourself as part of a, an effort uh, to rein in the agency? Yeah, the term "rein in," I suppose that's fair to, uh, to say. People helped me brought in to rein in the CIA, but I, you know, I prefer the word reform because the well, idea was not to stop the CIA completely, but to <clears throat> make it help it go in a new uh, direction. But, but here's the thing: I mean, you, you're on the clandestine side, uh, you're dealing with people who have an obvious talent for manipulation, for deceit, for for lying. That that those are the qualities that make a good spy, but. Those sorts of people can also be a, an, an incredible headache to manage, right? How, how do you effectively manage people who have those skills? I mean, can these people be depended on to retain their moral compass when their job is to lie and manipulate and deceive? Yeah, be Machiavellian. Yeah, and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah the spy culture, the right. spy, right. the spy mindset, and in terms of. These people are your clients, uh, so how do you know? It's a logical question. How do you? How is a lawyer? How do you manage those people? Manage those yeah. people? Well, I found during during all my years there that these people, for all their Machiavellian and uh, ways of operating and doing their thing on the outside, they're always remarkably open and candid uh, you know, with me. I mean, in the first place, if they were going to do something sort of chicanery, why would they come to me in in the first place? They mm -hmm. would just be able to do it. Uh, and you know, I wouldn't have necessarily known about. It. So they wanted to come. They actually, uh, I mean, more often than not, if I were ever to tow, towed up the numbers over the years, I would say many more. There were many more occasions where these spies would come to me 
with a proposal that they thought might be illegal, uh, or wondering whether it's illegal, and they wanted to come and get advice. And, and you know, they wanted, they wanted a lawyer to look at it. And more often than not, these are operations I couldn't find anything illegal under U.S. law. Maybe they were risky. Maybe mm -hmm. they were, to my mind, sort of silly or stupid or feckless. But, uh, but these, these, these people, and I dealt with three generations of CIA spies. They're, they're always remarkably open, I think, and forthcoming uh, to, to come and, and really legitimately, honestly, want my advice. Yes, and you found that, I mean, there are people who have, over the years, portrayed the, uh, the agency as being plagued by renegade spies. I mean, uh, 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 Tim Weiner, a New York Times reporter, wrote a big history of the CIA, Legacy of Ashes. In the 80s and 90s, he says that CIA station chiefs in Latin America were constantly getting in trouble for lying to superiors, uh, sexually harassing subordinates, uh, threatening underlings. He describes the, those things as, you know, an endemic problem. Is he? Is that accurate? No. I mean, the answer is no. I mean, I read Legacy of Ashes actually to prepare to prepare when I was doing research right. on my own memoir, and it's a. You know, in many ways, it's an impressive volume, over 700 pages, describing the entire history of CIA, but also clearly comes from a certain ideological and political bent, where you know, Mr. Weiner basically finds everything CIA has ever done in its entire history mm -hmm. to be either corrupt or responsible or stupid or you name it. So that is not, I mean, the fact that the, the, the assertion that these kinds of things uh, we're going on in Latin America at 89 constantly. Yeah, I mean, it's a vast overstatement. Some <clears> of the <throat> some of the things he alluded to there, sure, there were isolated incidents of of uh, that kind of uh, misbehavior, but that that is that is way overblown to generalize it the way he did. Well, uh, Porter Goss uh, succeeded George Tenet as director of the CIA. In 2004, he called the CIA agents a bunch of dysfunctional jerks. Remember that quote? Yeah, it was shortly before he came to CIA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, did he change his mind or? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, Porter Goss is actually, I didn't know him before he came to CIA. I just knew him slightly. He yeah. was chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. But I grew to respect him uh, and like him uh, enormously. Uh, I think that's a quote he probably would have liked to have uh, taken back. He made it while he was still a member of Congress. True or false, for all the talk about the agency being this rogue organization, in the final analysis, this agency, unlike any other agency in the federal government, reflects the vices and virtues of whoever happens to be president. True. Uh, I served under seven presidents, uh, beginning with Ford, mm -hmm. uh, ending with uh, Obama, uh, and obviously vastly different personalities, political persuasions of, of each of the seven. But they all came to view, and I think all presidents always will view CIA, I put in the book, their personal pop stand. It is unique, I think, among federal agencies that exist solely to carry out, to implement the president's wishes. Mm. Uh, and every president comes to view the CIA uh, as indispensable. I mean, it's, it's always been a very um, nimble organization about operating quickly. Uh, it operates in secret, which of course presidents like. Uh, it doesn't have to, it has unique uh, rules that apply in terms of appropriating money, spending money. It's just a, it's just a very, it's a very um, enticing, albeit risky, uh, 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 piece of national security machinery the president has his, his uh, disposal. Well, let me uh, take you to uh, 1980 and the election of Ronald Reagan, who in turn brought in his campaign manager, Bill Casey, uh, to run the CIA. You in your book say that Casey was, quote, the toughest, smartest, and most complex CIA director that, uh, that you had ever worked for. Uh, no, I, I certainly buy the complex part, but I, I guess in this context, I'm wondering how you define smart. Well, he was a brilliant man. I mean, it, it, he had a, he, uh, first of all, he, he was, um, 
he he had previous experience in spy world as a young man. He was part of the OSS, that fabled free the World War II espionage right. organization headed by General Wild Bill Donovan. And Casey was a part of that. So he actually, he was no dilettante when it came to spy news. After the war, he went to law school, became a hugely successful lawyer, uh, then got into the financial world in New York, became fabulously successful and wealthy. Uh, and then the Nixon administration was named to head the Securities Exchange Commission, where mm -hmm. this was where the complex part came in. A, a, a more rock ribbed conservative Republican you couldn't find. But, but as you may recall, he became the scourge of Wall Street when he became chairman of the SEC, cracking down on corporate uh, misconduct and bribery, which was an, apparently fairly endemic in the early 70s. So he was a, he was a, a very smart, complex guy, wonderfully well read. Um, he was also a bit of a character. I mean, he, he, he spoke in this mumble. Uh, uh, he was a lawyer by training himself. So I had, when I was dealing with him, I had to, as he would remind me more than once, he was a lawyer too. He could be gruff. He had no sense of public relations and also no sense of congressional relations and the need to, to stroke the the Congress, our congressional overseers. I mean, he just had no patience for it. Well, I mean, wasn't he uh, something of a throwback? He really never did buy into the idea, did he, that the CIA had an obligation to answer to Congress? You know, I, th I think, I get, again, he grew out of the OSS days. Yeah. I think he was basically a buccaneer. I mean, yeah. he was, and he didn't understand, he didn't accept uh, the notion of congressional oversight. So in 1985, President Reagan signed this presidential finding, which as we all now know, authorized the selling of arms to Iran in exchange for freeing some American hostages in Lebanon, mm -hmm. which in and of itself would have been a real problem for the administration. But what turned it into a full-blown scandal was the revelation that the funds that were used from that arms sale were used to support the Contras in Nicaragua in blatant violation of U.S. law. As you sit here today, do you f believe that Casey uh, had nothing to do with that? With the diversion? Yeah. I, I you know, I try to deal with that in, in the book. Uh, uh, that's been debated yeah. uh, down through the years. Casey and died before. I don't think in your book you ever say whether you think he was or was not aware or approved of this? I don't think he did. You I don't, don't think he did? I don't think he did. He, I, I mean, honestly, had he known about it, I don't think he would have objected. But I, I think all the available evidence is that this was Ollie North at the White House, at the NSC, who was doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, Casey died right literally at the beginning of the Iran-Contra hearing, so he was never brought to account. And of course, there was that famous story by Bob Woodward. I was going to ask you about that. Veil, yeah. where, he, where he claimed in at the end uh, that, that he had this deathbed yeah. conversation. Yeah, Bob Woodward Casey. in this book says that he was able to get into Casey's hospital room and get what in essence was a deathbed confession from Casey that he, Casey, had in fact ordered this diversion. You don't think that happened? No, I just don't think there's any evidence that ever... That ever uh, Happened. I mean, it was a very, it was a, it was a huge story at the time. It was a dramatic, yeah. to my mind, too dramatic denouement to, to to the Woodward book, and it was a enigmatic response by Casey. You know, but Woodward supposedly asked him at the hospital bed, "Did you know about the diversion?" And Casey said, "Said yeah, you know, not." And then Casey, Woodward said, "Why?" And quote, Casey response, "I believed." Right. Very dramatic. Too dramatic. So you think Bob Woodward, one of this country's most revered journalists, lied to sell books? Well, I don't think this, I don't think the story is true. I don't want to use the word lie, but I, no, I don't <laughs> but think that's this, what it is, yeah, right? Yeah, I don't he made think, up I don't, the whole thing. I don't think it ever happened. I don't yeah. think it ever happened. Uh, no one besides Woodward in all the ensuing years has come forward to say that Casey knew about this. Casey's wife went to her grave. Uh, uh, she died some years later, denying that Woodward ever got into that hotel room. It would have been a hospital room. 
Hmm. It would have been physically impossible for Woodward to get into the hospital. But Woodward is sticking by the story. Yeah, right? well, what, I mean, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I do say in the book, in fairness, I cannot prove it. I cannot prove it. It's just my conclusion, my belief from being there at the time and knowing all the players involved that it could not have happened. Yeah. But I can't prove it. Let's talk a little bit about the CIA's relationship with people who are known as uh, dirty assets. Uh, these are people who are often uh, human rights abusers. Uh, they often are, uh, they may be terrorists themselves. They may be involved in the drug trade. Uh, but of course, the world is a complicated place. And from time to time, the CIA has uh, acquired extremely valuable information uh, working with these people. Uh, but I, of course, there's a moral hazard here. And the question is, how does the agency do business with these folks over an extended period without becoming accessories to their crimes? Yeah. Uh, and you actually looked into that at one point. Uh, you did a review of the CIA's uh, relationship with these dirty assets. So yeah, that what, was, what sorts of conclusions did you come to? Yeah, yeah. this was in the mid-90s, uh, seemingly, seemingly a million years uh, yeah. ago, uh, given what's happened in, in the subsequent 20, 25 years. Yeah, this issue of dirty assets, I, you know, I know in my book, I consider it to be the most enduring and vexing policy and legal conundrum that CIA really has had to contend with throughout <coughs> its entire existence. I mean, it, to be a spy organization, an effective spy organization, you have to recruit people, foreigners overseas, who get close mm -hmm. to bad guys of one kind or another. And of course, the closest you can get to bad guys is to be a bad guy yourself. Right. Uh, especially in the terrorism arena. Uh, uh, you want to, you need to recruit members of terrorist organizations. Uh, they, by definition, in order to be viable, have to have blood on their hands. Sometimes they have to have American blood on their hands. So how does CIA deal morally, ethically, with, with evil guys, evil, necessary, but well-connected guys. How do, how do you work with people like that, mm -hmm. recruit people like that, pay people like that, without becoming complicit in their, their own separate nefarious uh, activities? It came up originally in the mid-'90s as a result of all of the Central America Casey Crusade activities in the 80s, where we our, our, the agency worked with these right-wing regimes in Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, right. uh, run by thugs. Right. Uh, and these thugs, it turn, turns out, uh, were also systematically abusing, committing human rights vi violations on, on their own people, and, and incidentally, once in a while, against Americans. Right. Uh, uh, and so this all came back in the mid-90s uh, uh, with a vengeance. And there were a number of congressional hearings, investigations, uh, where CIA was accused of, of basically uh, becoming uh, infiltrated, uh, sympathetic to death squads, that became yeah. the phrase. You become an accessory to the crimes, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and it led to uh, Congress demanding, and the CIA director was incoming at that point, a guy named John Deutsch, commissioned an internal review for CIA to look through its entire cadre of, of assets to determine which ones had this, this sort of human rights baggage and whether they were in fact worth, you know, worth continuing to associate with, mm -hmm. given their, their undoubtedly unsavory personal histories. Right. And so... What conclusions uh, were drawn from that review? Well, the first of all, one of the conclusions that was drawn was that we didn't have nearly as many unsavory assets as, as, as I think the perception was. Uh, and that a few of them had lost their intelligence value or had done things so repellent that, that no, I mean, even a U.S. spy organization uh, couldn't justify continuing to, to uh, to deal with them, uh, so so there, the list the list was not that long, but it was it, I, 
you know, it was it was refined somewhat. There was a scrubbing, at what we call the what mm -hmm. we call the asset scrub. So have the standards changed? The rules changed by which mm. the CIA uh, conducts these relationships? Well, it was ironic. All of this took place in the mid '90s. So that's what the political winds were. CIA yeah. was too abusive. Was was consorting with all of, with too many thugs and lowlifes in the world. Then of course 9/11 happened. Mm. What was the cry that went out immediately after 9/11 from Congress from the media? Well, CIA had been too risk averse in the in run up to 9/11. Wasn't aggressive enough. Wasn't imagined enough to infiltrate terrorist uh, organizations. Uh, why didn't would they know about the 9/11 attacks? So this yeah. phrase became risk averse. Now, so do the guidelines, as a consequence, change? Do you get, do you get whipsawed? You know, in one in, in one uh, period, the guidelines are strict, and you can't deal with these folks. In another period, the, the guidelines become a lot more uh, liberal. Yeah, more yeah, lax. yeah. You do get. I mean, you do get whipsawed. I mean, like for example, Manuel Noriega was our man in Panama, a, a rather brutal fellow. He was heavily involved in the drug trade. He had one of his primary political opponents tortured and beheaded. George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush did business with him when he was CIA director, and so did Casey. In, in today's CIA, would we do, would we can, would we do business with a guy like Noriega? I don't think with a with a with a Noriega we would. Uh -huh. uh, I should note parenthetically that, you know, your views were recalled. Noriega was was ultimately arrested. And, Extradited right. to we the U.S. to stand, to stand <laughs> so, out, and CIA did yeah. support the Justice Department prosecution. Lord Noriega was a, I mean, a, a unique case. I mean, he was so vile and so violent. Even though he was head of a country that was strategically important, Panama, to the United States, mm -hmm. certainly in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, I couldn't conceive that today that that CIA would have on its payroll somebody quite like that. There's a book that just came out about uh, Robert Ames, a very distinguished CIA uh, operative who died in uh, Lebanon when, at the embassy that was blown up by terrorists. Right. Uh, Mr. Byrd makes the claim that one of the guys responsible for that bombing is a guy that we're doing business with and we're protecting in the United States. Is that possible? That yeah, I'm not going to talk about that one, but there is conceivable. I mean, yeah. And again, I, I would just have you recall those days after 9/11 that you know that CIA should have been should have been recruiting basically these terrible people, even ones that had had a culpability for mm -hmm. for 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 attacks against Americans, because that's how you that's how you get close get close to these these terrorist organizations and recruit the baddest of the bad. So. That's why I say it's 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 dealing with these people where the line is. I always consider that the most difficult thicket, uh, moral and legal thicket, to have to to have to uh, uh, negotiate. Yeah. So I guess is there a succinct way to uh, that that you can help me understand where that line is now? Well, I think it just in general, I think the line is that if you're going to recruit somebody, a foreigner. Who is directly complicit in attacks against Americans, and certainly in the murder of Americans? This person would have to be so, so uh, uh, important, so unique, so indispensable uh, that it would surmount, counterbalance all of those. So it's a co it's less a it's not a moral judgment. It's more of a cost benefit kind of a judgment. Cost benefit, and the <coughs> and the other thing I think would mm -hmm. have to be done in a case like that is to make sure that the White House, that the president personally approved it, and that this is important that the congressional oversight committees were told about this in advance mm -hmm. and given the opportunity to weigh in. I imagine you've been asked more than a hundred times now what your thoughts were when the planes hit the Twin Towers and the Pentagon on 9-11. So I'm not going to ask you that question. Oh, yeah. But I am going to ask you uh, about a meeting that occurred, uh, I guess it was uh, roughly seven months later, when you first heard about these enhanced interrogation techniques that were being contemplated. We're talking about uh, sleep deprivation, slapping, stress positions, and of course, waterboarding. Uh, 
You were the agency's chief legal officer at the time, and you say in your book that at that moment you had the power to nip all that enhanced interrogation stuff in the bud. And, and I guess I find that a little hard to believe. And, 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 and the, way I, the reason I say that is because, I mean, if you think back to those times, it was generally assumed that another terrorist attack was imminent. I mean, people were scared. Uh, there was a huge amount of uh, uh, anger and frustration. At that point in time, do you really think that you could have s stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, guys, this slapping and waterboarding, all this other stuff you're talking about, is, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it violates American law, it violates international law, we're not going to do it. D do you really think you could have made that stick? Yeah. Well, first of all, Mario, you, you correctly, of course, described the atmosphere in the country, and yeah. the agency in those first months after 9-11. But yeah, I think I could have done it. I mean, as it happened, I became the chief legal officer uh, uh, at CIA a month after 9-11. Um, my predecessor left. I had been the senior deputy, so I, I was elevated to at that acting general counsel. So I happened to be in the chair. Now, at that point, I had been a lawyer at CIA for 25 years. I dealt with generations of CIA operatives, including all the, all the CIA people who were who were involved in the in this idea to create this program, and mm -hmm. this was created. Make no, make no mistake. This was a CIA initiative. I mean, it didn't come from the White House. It started at CIA. Uh, but I knew all those people. I was very close and known for years. The CIA director at the time, George Tenet, the deputy director, John McLaughlin. These are guys I had grown up with and knew me. And I think, honestly, I had acquired at that point a reputation. I mean, a, a influence clout that experience that if I had gone to them and said, look, I don't know whether this is illegal or not. I've never heard of any of this stuff before, which is true. I never heard of waterborne. But I'm telling you, this is going to get the agency in trouble. This stuff is brutal. It may be illegal. I don't know, but it could be illegal. And don't do it. Don't do it. I am confident I could have sold that, I, and that would have prevailed, even in those times. But of course, as history now knows, I did not do that. And why didn't you do it? Well, you know, to get back to the preamble to your question, this was a time of, an, of unprecedented fear and dread in the country about mm -hmm. the next, not, not if there would be a second attack on the homeland, but when. I mean, it was a, just after, this was right after the shoe bomber uh, attempt. This was after the anthrax letters, which people at that point thought might have been terrorist, Al-Qaeda-inspired. I mean, it's just unprecedented feeling in the country. We all remember it. And here was a program, unprecedented in this history, that our experts, not just our operatives, but our analysts, our scientists, our psychologists, uh, were convinced it was the only way to, to break the first high-level Al-Qaeda detainee we had captured just a a month or a couple of months earlier, a guy named uh, Abu, Abu Zubaydah. Zubaydah. Yeah. And he was, in our people's view, stonewalling. And that if there was going to be another attack, this guy would know about it. And he basically was thumbing his nose at his interrogators. And these techniques were the only ones that, that our, our professionals considered had a chance of, of breaking down his resistance and getting him to talk. So that was the environment I was facing. I, you know, time was of the essence to, to consider this. I remember walking around CIA smoking a cigar right after I got this briefing, trying to process it, and playing out in my mind the scenario that, okay, I could go back in there and say, this, oh, this is crazy, this is not, this is not going to go any further. I could have, and I would have gone to George Tennant and the head of operations and said that. And as I said, I think that would have stuck. But then. And I play out the scenario further in my head. Okay, so it, so so that happens. We never do it. Zubeda, therefore, never talks. Keeps stonewalling. Let's say a month or two months after that, we have Zubeda in our custody. There's another massive attack on the homeland. Turns out Zubeda tells us afterwards, "Yeah, I knew about that, and you couldn't make me tell you." So there would be potentially thousands again American bodies lying in rubble or in the streets somewhere. And I would, and in the inevitable post-mortem, it would become clear, and more importantly, I would know in my own mind, that 
that that at the moment that our people, our experts had said this was the way to get information, I had stopped it. I had stopped that from happening. And so, so as a personal moral, a personal moral standpoint, I simply couldn't countenance uh, having to live with that, with that, with that legacy, with that uh, scenario. But what you're describing doesn't sound to me like a legal analysis. It sounds like perhaps a moral analysis, a political analysis, maybe even a military analysis, but not a legal analysis, no, is it? No, I don't think it was a legal analysis. But I you, were the, you yeah. were the chief legal officer. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I didn't know at that point, you know, I was fire hose with, these, with the, this, this idea one afternoon. I didn't. And I had mercifully never had to become familiar with the torture statute in my entire career. So this thought process I was describing was literally an hour after I'd gotten a briefing. So I didn't know whether this stuff was legal or illegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember thinking, well, I don't know what torture is, but some of this stuff like waterboarding and a couple of the other techniques seem at least close to the line. But no, I mean, I was making, I was, I think, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I was making my own, taking my own moral uh, uh, temperature. So is it fair to say that because of the stakes here, you didn't feel comfortable acting like a lawyer, that, that you, what you were going to do was make a moral assessment, perhaps even a, you know, a scientific, you, you alluded to your scientists, your professionals, you know, I don't know how experienced they were in interrogations. No, they weren't. But I mean, they not were, really. They, everyone yeah. was kind of, yeah. everyone was, there was not a lot of expertise in the room. But it doesn't sound like the law had much to do with what you ultimately said or didn't say. Not, not, not my, not the initial react. I mean, the yeah. initial reaction. Really, the law was secondary. It was. I mean, frankly, there was a certain, or a certain cold practicality about it too. I'd been at CIA long enough to know what I would be told about proposed activities, which one were going to get us into big, big trouble down the road. And I knew, first time I heard about these proposed techniques that somehow, someday, they were going to cause the agency immense problems, right. law or no law. Uh, and I knew, I mean, that was my, that was the other media assessment I had. Right. Uh, I also said, speaking of the law, that I was not going to be the only lawyer to, to hear about these programs and be the final legal arbiter about whether they constitute torture. As I indicated, I didn't know what the rules were. I didn't know what the you know, legal pr precedents were. And uh, so that's why I ultimately decided, and some book reviewers have called it a punt, but, but it was a strategic punt, that I wanted to go to the highest legal authority I could in the government, which was the Department of Justice off of the Legal Council, to get a definitive, comprehensive answer to that. And that, of course, what ultimately Right, produced. which some have likened to asking a family friend to write a prescription. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if the family friend is a is a doctor, um, Doctor you, you, yeah, you expect Doctor John you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, one may believe this or not believe this. I was agnostic. I didn't. I didn't know. I honestly. If I didn't know how the Office of Counsel would come out, if they came out and concluded, yeah, this is all torture, that would have been fine with me. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I honestly did not know going in what, how they would come out. As you know, both the President of the United States uh, has, and uh, at least one former CIA director, Leon Panetta, are now on the record saying that there were interrogations at times that our people conducted that did rise to the level of torture. I know you don't agree with that characterization, but in your book you do say that some of these interrogations were brutal. That is the word you use. Uh, you also say that when some of these uh, enhanced interrogation practices were first described to you, they struck you as sadistic and terrifying. Again, your words. So in your mind, what is exactly is the difference between torture and an interrogation that is merely terrifying, sadistic, or brutal? Well, it's, I mean, it's difficult. The, <laughs> the legal line is, is I, you know, I discovered, is amorphous. The torture statute speaks in general terms, extended physical right. or mental suffering. There's never been a prosecution under the torture statute. 
So, so we have to parse these words. Yeah. I mean, one, I think one of the reasons this this is all this has become an enduringly complex and divisive issue, <laughs> certainly among lawyers, is that you know y'all one tends to bring his personal perceptions to to these things. You know what? Oh, geez, if this was done to me, I'd certainly consider it torture. Uh, uh, and that's where I was. I mean, I uh, the waterboarding was was brutal. I can't imagine the, the idea of sim simulated drowning. There was another technique that was proposed at the outset that never was actually implemented that I thought was even, as I say in the book, even more terrifying. I was not allowed to to specify that technique uh, in the book because see I said I couldn't, it was still classified. But I, th I think what, what happens is people, you know, you look at, well, what is torture? What, what, you know, as, as opposed to, you know, As opposed brutality. to brutal. Yeah. 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 How do you draw that line? Well, it's difficult. There's no statute is, on brutality. There is one right. on torture. Which yeah. means that if you torture, you can be prosecuted. If you're merely being brutal, you can't, you're, you're not yeah, prosecutable, right? Well, you, no, you wouldn't violate the law, but you certainly would be subject to to you know, subsequent moral and legal opprobrium, you know, which is what I right you know, faced in later years. But I mean, in your mind, is there a way to distinguish between brutality and torture? Well, again, you know, people ask me, what would I, what would I uh, consider uh, yeah. torture? Uh, yeah, I would. I would say pulling out fingernails, you know, uh, uh, was torture. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, drugs, you know, causing uh, causing people to basically lose their minds over with with drug injections. That would be torture. Uh, honestly, I didn't think. I mean, upon reflection, and certainly after I got the office of Justice Department memos, I didn't think waterboarding amounted to torture. Now, yeah. maybe I was thinking too narrowly as yeah. a lawyer. Yeah, but, but as we're having this semantic discussion, I have to say I'm having this flashback to uh, Bill Clinton when he was president and stood before the cameras and said, I did not have sex with that woman, right? Now, I suppose, you know, if you define sex in a ridiculously narrow way, then perhaps you could argue that Clinton didn't have sex with Monica Lewinsky. But, uh, you know, it would have to be a ridiculously narrow definition. So I'm just wondering, you know, when you're talking about uh, someone being waterboarded 83 times, which is what happened to Abu Zubaydah, or 183 times, which is what happened to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and you're trying to argue that this is not torture, I just, I'm just wondering whether in that same region of ridiculousness. <laughs> well, Mario, I must say, of all the interviews I've done in this book, this is the first time that the uh, debate over torture was equated to Bill Clinton's Yeah, I know. That's the way my mind life. works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize no, for that. I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I take your point. Yeah. I take your point. That, that, uh, and again, I totally understand and accept that people say, well, this is just fatuous yeah. sophistry you guys are operating under. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, all I can tell you, it was. I mean, it was. It, if I thought it was torture, yeah, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And just let me give you a hypothetical, and you tell me how, as a, as a CIA lawyer, you you assess this. Let's say the CIA goes into a Western European country and kidnaps one of their citizens, and then brings them to a place, not for any due process, but to a a, a place where this person is treated brutally, um, is there, are there any alarms that would go, given that hypothetical, as the lawyer for the CIA, would any alarms go off on your head? Oh, sure, sure. Now, would, it, would they be fire alarms or would they, that I would necessarily say, no, you can't do that, that's illegal? What would no. you say? Well, it'd be, again, it's all, it's all, the devil is in the details, uh, so to speak. Um, if it's a, if, if it's a citizen of a country of a close U.S. ally, uh, uh, that would be a that would be a red flag, not necessarily disqualifying, but would kick it up into the level of risk. And we talked before about about cost benefit analysis. Right. That that in my mind would require very high level policy approval in the U.S. government. So that's one factor. Second factor you mentioned that 
he, the, the, the guy, we would take the guy to a country where he would be brutally uh, interrogated. We cannot, we would not, and I certainly wouldn't as a CIO of countenance, us taking, grabbing a guy, taking to a country for the purpose knowing that the country, and let's say even encouraging the third country to torture the guy. Mm -hmm. It's called outsourcing torture, another phrase that entered the post 9-11 lexicon. That would be, to my mind, verboten. I mean, if we can't, if the United States, if it's against the law of the United States government to engage in torture, we simply can't, can't eliminate the problem by having some other country do it. So, the, so those would be the kind, kinds of limits. The third country uh, would have to, you know, conduct itself, and see, I had to, would have to get reasonable assurances that they would not torture the guy. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Right. I know you can't talk about specific cases uh, easily, but the case of Abu Almar, Italian citizen who was taken, uh, I think, from Milan and brought to Egypt for some harsh treatment. I mean, there are those who say that this is an example of uh, the CIA violating international law. You, you disagree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for not make, you know, <laughs> understanding the constraints I operate on. You know, sometimes I would like to talk more about some right. of these things than I'm authorized right. because I think there's a there's another story I, to tell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I can't. So that's that's the way it goes. But no, I I would uh, a, a a operation like that. I would I do not think on its face uh, well, certainly doesn't violate U.S. law. Right. What about international law? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we we um, you know, I've never gotten a you know, God knows, I've been, you know, busy enough over the years trying to trying to trying to stay up with the U.S. laws about espionage activity. The let's say the for instance the Carlos the Jackal rendition uh, from Sudan to France, and that was not a, you know, it was a rendition. It wasn't an extradition. I mean, he was grabbed. Right. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the European Court of of uh, human rights uh, upheld that as lawful. But so again, I, was I'm a, not he was brought to a place where he got some judicial proceeding. Right, right, right. right. But yeah. that's not what apparently happened to Abu Omar. And again, I know you. It's an awkward. Yeah, you know, I, I'm putting you in an awkward. No, situation. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I guess I don't accept the premise that just that it would have to be a sine qua non that the individual would have to be tried in in the or to get court. some sort of due process. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, some sort of due process. I were released, for instance, or or have access to counsel or uh, right. Due and in process. these and these and in these extraordinary conditions, there was no due process, right? Well, some were held for 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 lengthy periods of time. Some yeah. were some were ultimately let go uh, without getting into specifics. Abu Omar was ultimately let go by Egypt. Right. Um, um, After going through a rather unpleasant time. Well, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, I mean, these are, one of the other, I mean, one of the um, uh, many complicated, fascinating but complicated factors in, in anything you talk about with CIA and the law, it has to do with renditions. I mean, in the post-9-11 era, most of these guys were, were, were citizens of countries that frankly would, if we run them back to their own country, these countries are not paragons of Jeffersonian democracies. Uh, uh, for their domestic political opponents, they could be extraordinarily brutal and mm -hmm. harsh. But but we really did did go to extraordinary efforts to get assurances from these governments that at least with respect to the the guys we were rendering, that they would not treat them the same way as they would necessarily be treating their own political dissidents. You know, three years ago, you gave an interview for Frontline, and you said that you believed that the Enhanced Interrogation Program provided this country with extraordinary valuable information, and you said at the time that no one could seriously argue with that proposition. Now, in light of this 6,000-page Senate report that we're hearing about, in light of this Panetta review, are you as, still as certain about that? Yes. Yes. Um, I think, again, if the public reports have been leaked out by the Senate report, I assume are accurate that the program was useless. Mm -hmm. well, a couple things. First of all, this program was, was conducted over well over six years. 
begun in 2002, ended with the Obama administration's arrival at the end of 2008, <clears throat> becoming, as we all know, increasingly controversial and divisive over the years. And I oversaw the program from a legal perspective all those years. I mean, just taking me personally, why would I, why would the CIA continue to engage in a, a program, a controversial program that was becoming more toxic by the day, that was increasingly causing those of us who were heavily involved in it, both professional, well certainly professional risk in my case, professional damage, why would CIA continue a program in light of all of that if it wasn't working, if it well, wasn't doing anything? What would you say? Well, I, I think a possible answer is that these things kind of take on a life of their own, whether it's a 10-year war in Vietnam or Iran-Contra or, uh, you know, Brennan saying initially that for the CIA to hack the Senate's computers was beyond the scope of reason. Well, he had to take that back. I mean, I think these things can take on a life of their own, and dissenters are uh, prevented from uh, participating in the key meetings. Isn't that possible? Yeah. Well, you you gave me a, a lump of different a scenarios. Lump, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, all I can tell you, I can crazy start. things. You know, my point is that you know, crazy things just because they're crazy don't just die a natural death. No, I mean, and, and particularly in a closed society like the CIA. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I understand that that logic. And the yeah. pre if I were on the outside, I would, I would, you know, I understand why people would would, you know, think that. Right. All you tell, I was on the inside for all those years, and if it wasn't working, I mean, I, I, I promise you, I wouldn't allow the program to continue to for nothing else to protect the agency that I grew to love. Why subject it to any further additional criticism, exposure, possibly criminal exposure, for a program that wasn't working? I would never, I can just tell you, I would never have done that. I would never have countenanced that. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say uh, next week there's another big terrorist attack on the homeland, as big or bigger than 9-11. Uh, Let's say it's ISIS this time that did it. And once again, people are scared and they're calling for tough measures. Um, knowing what you know about the costs and benefits of that enhanced interrogation program under uh, George W. Bush, is there, are, are there good reasons to go down that road again? No, I mean, as I, as I say, I believe the program, convinced the program was, was effective, uh, was useful, was worthwhile, was legal. But given all the water that has gone under the bridge for the last 12 years on this program, I don't think, even in the face, God forbid, of another massive attack on the homeland, it would be, it would be wise uh, for CIA to, to reinstitute a program of aggressive interrogation, no matter what happens. And honestly, it'd be hard, it'd be hard for us to, to, to say any president, regardless of party, uh, who's, who, on whose watch that happens, would ever contemplate reauthorizing a program like that. I just don't think it's, it's uh, in the cards. But I mean, you, you, know, you know, Marty, that if there is another catastrophic attack, there will be, there will be people in Congress and in yeah, the media who will say, you guys are too risk averse. Yeah, it, it, you just know Dick Cheney will be wheeled out and he'll say, you know, the reason this attack happened was because they weren't doing these brutal techniques, uh, you know, during this period that preceded this attack, and we've got to ramp it up again. And, and what do you say to Dick Cheney when he says that? We are, we are not going to, well, we, I would say to Dick Ness, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just struck by the irony of having to make an argument like that to Mr. Cheney, um, that the CIA should resist. Uh, Why? This should resist. It is, the program was valuable, it was valuable. If it was useless, it would be an easy call. It would be a hard call to say, but I would advise a CIA director. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have to advise him. Given all that happened before, given, given what this agency went through, what its people went through, uh, being second guessed, being, being investigated. But what about the safety of the country? Well, the safety of the country is, is, is paramount, is paramount. Uh, I'm just telling you that that 
even under those circumstances. I mean, CIA could be extraordinarily useful in any event. I would just not use that tool. I would not use that tool given given all all of what's happened over the last twelve. So, years. in the final analysis, are you saying that you know, as beneficial as that program may have been, the costs were just too high? I think they were. I think it's the cost we're going to keep paying. Yeah. Last question. Uh, you've devoted so much of your life to the CIA. Uh, and its imperfections, uh, its scandals, its screw-ups notwithstanding. It's very clear in your book that you grew to love this organization. Uh, now that you're out of it, do you miss it? Sometimes, sometimes. I don't miss it, honestly, Marty, as much as I, as I thought I would. You know, I'd been on, we were talking about the bubble of CIA. It's a very enticing, seductive to be, first of all, the no secret, that's human nature. And I was happily involved inside that secret bubble for so long. And once you leave CIA, at least in my case, you know, that last day, I had my retirement ceremony, I gave, turned in my badge, I walked out the door, and that's it, it's over. And so I was about to go cold turkey, and I, I, I had twingeons about that. But as I decompressed, and writing this book was very helpful to me for no other reason than it, it was, uh, it, it caused me to decompress. It's like a catharsis. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't miss it as much. I think the only day, the only day I really wish since I'd left five years ago that I was back in there was the, was the day that bin Laden was taken down. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think what happened was, first off, 34 years is a long time. Secondly, those last several years were, were grueling. Now, I didn't at the time, you know, I just try to get, try and get through the day's crises. Uh, I didn't realize until after I was gone how grueling it really was and how how relieved I would be not to have the kinds of responsibilities uh, that I that were placed on my shoulders uh, those last several years. So it was a great sense of relief. Mm -hmm. John Rizzo, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.